Gut health, gut health, gut health. That seems to be all we are talking about lately. And I am here for it because I think, you know, it. we have so many illnesses, diseases that are popping up that are like super, super rampant anymore in dogs. And we're all like, oh my gosh, what is happening? Well, we need to be looking at the gut. And so I don't think I can say it enough. <laughs> Uh, that is why I'm so very happy to have Betsy Redman with me here today. Um, she is with Innovative Pet Lab, and we're going to be going over, first of all, what Innovative Pet Lab is. I only recently found them because, uh, well, I'm a holistic pet health coach, and it's kind of what I'm supposed to know. <laughs> I'm supposed to know how to do. And um, so I think a lot of pet parents don't know what Innovative Pet Lab is, how it differentiate, like how we differentiate them from animal biome, that's a big question. And why their lab reporting, the testing that they do is so important. And then um, my dog, Kim, which you guys know is, I, I, I am always just like confounded. She seems like the healthiest dog in the world. And yet I do all the, I do all the tests. I am the crazy dog mom. So I did a comprehensive test from Innovative Pet Lab. So we're going to talk about the six markers that you're going to see when you do the comprehensive test as well. So Betsy, thank you so much for joining me. Would you mind introducing yourself and in Innovative Pet Lab just a little bit? Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. Betsy, thank you so much for joining me. Would you mind introducing yourself and in Innovative Pet Lab just a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm excited to be here. Um, so I'm Betsy Redmond. I uh, started working in functional and integrative laboratory testing 15 some years ago. I got a you know I have a master's in nutrition from Emory. I have a doctorate in nutrition, and I started working at a functional medicine laboratory for people. Um, and we worked there for a while and we would, yeah, I worked there for quite a while. And then we would get uh, people who want to do our testing. And I think, you know, Karen Becker, there are other people. And so when it was a small lab before it got bought out, um, you know, we could do those types of things. So, you know, our Probably our most interesting was grizzly bears, um, like their fatty acids and hibernating. But so um, we... So it was like me and probably five other people who work at the lab and have worked together for a long time wanted to start doing our pets, but we didn't have a reference range. So last year we started Innovative Pet Lab because I can see the progression that people looking at holistic functional medicines probably like 10 years ahead of where the vet world is. So we could see that coming and we wanted to make those tests available um, and a lot of the research, so I spend a lot of my time doing research on new markers or the markers that are already out there. And a lot of that research was on pets because it's always been one of my peeves. It's like I look and I see, oh, they put these animals through all this to get this information. Like it really needs to have been worth it to just get a little more information, you know. So I, I was very cognizant of how much animal research was out there. Probably a lot on dogs, less on cats. Dogs are easier to work with in research because mm -hmm. they're so loving and agreeable to their detriment. But um, so a lot of the stuff has ha, ha, is transitions. So a lot of their mammals were mammals, and a lot is similar. So they've done a lot of research. So that's you know, that we wanted to just see what was going on. So we've been in business about a year now. And do you want me to say how we're different from Animal Biome? Yeah, or I think it's a good time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so when we, when I, you know, probably 15 years ago, I worked on one of the, the, the first tests that had microbiome assessment for clinicians, for doctors um, in the, you know, clinical world. Um, 
And so in that test, we looked at microbiome. We looked at the phylum and the individual bacteria. And then we also looked at functional markers, more physiologic status. And through the years with that test, what we found was, you know, uh, microbiome and different bacteria are really interesting, but they're generally associated. So there are bacteria that are associated with inflammation or associated with poor digestion. So we wanted, we found the markers that actually look at inflammation or leaky gut or things to be more actionable. And that's why we chose the markers we did. We felt like they were actionable and they gave real direct information. Yes. And so the difference in the innovative pet lab testing and the animal biome testing, as I understand it, um, is that the animal biome testing is looking at the bacteria in the gut through a fecal sample. So they can tell you X, Y, and Z bacteria are present, A, B, C are not, and they should be blah, 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 all the different things. But the innovative pet lab testing is actually looking at inflammatory markers in the gut So it has absolutely nothing to do, well, pretty much nothing to do with the strains of bacteria that are or are not present. It's just the physiological, uh, like the markers. Right. So, you know, it's looking at intestinal inflammation and some markers are known to be inflammatory, some of those bacteria. So they do have associations. If you see certain bacteria, it's oftentimes you'll see inflammation. But then the next question is, is there inflammation? So that since there's just so many synergistic activities going on in the gut, so we just look at that. We look at inflammation and immunity. We look at intestinal permeability with leaky gut. And then we look at digestion and detox. Okay. So that was, yes, what I was going to bring up as well, because as I'm looking on innovativepetlab.com, I made the mistake of putting pet labs and it's like, nope, I don't know what that is. (laughs) (laughs) InnovativePetLab.com. You can do the comprehensive review, which is what um, I did. The blue box is the comprehensive review. Mm -hmm. Um, But then you can do a basic gut check, digestion and detox, leaky gut, or inflammation and immunity. And those are separate testing. But do they, they like, they look at the the same thing. So the comprehensive looks at everything. And then Got the it. different pairs look at different combinations. So usually uh, people will do the comprehensive and then follow up just in with, with the grouping. So if you just have inflammation or you just had intestinal permeability, you don't have to do the whole test again. Okay. That makes so much sense to me now while I'm looking at it. And as like, as someone who... I like, I'm fortunate. I get to work with, get to work with dogs and cats all the time. (laughs) And I love it. I love it so much. Um, But the reality is the majority of dogs that I get to work with, they, it seem like we're, we're taking the big picture and all of these different pieces and all of the symptoms and blah, 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 that the pet parent is giving us. And we're saying that sounds a whole heck of a lot like leaky gut there's inflammation in the gut. So we're like making these educated guesses, I guess would be (laughs) the the best way to talk about them. And this testing will actually let us know for sure. Yep. There's, there's inflammation in the gut. There's dysbiosis. There's permeability, um, intestinal permeability as, as scientists like you like to call it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So yeah, I mean, we don't consider ourselves diagnostic. Diagnosis technically is made, you know, by a veterinarian, just like in people, like a right. medical doctor. So you have to put the whole picture together. So, um, right. yeah, so, so this- we're looking at the specifically what's happening. Okay. So this is something that, um, this is available to pet parents in addition to whatever you're doing with your veterinarian, you're trying to make things simpler and easier for the pet parent, especially, and I know I've talked about this on the podcast before, and I think we're going to start talking about it a little more because more and more people are starting to realize that veterinary care is becoming very difficult to access. 
Like, Mm -hmm. and and this obviously has nothing to do with Innovative Pet Lab, but um, there just aren't enough veterinarians. There aren't enough people going through veterinary school. The burnout rate is high, yada, yada. There's so many things, so many factors, and it is becoming more and more difficult for a lot of people, especially in more rural areas, um, to actually get vet care. But even if you are lucky enough to have a wonderful veterinarian that you love and trust, um, having this testing available to you as a pet parent can really make a huge difference in how you move forward with uh, caring for your pet. So uh, like I said, I did the comprehensive test for my dog, Kim, and there were six markers that I got test results on. So if you would uh, wouldn't mind kind of explain I mean, when you get the test results. So if you're just listening, no worries, you're going to be able to understand everything. But if you're seeing on the on the video, I have <laughs> my test results and there's like a little blurb explaining what each one of these markers are and kind of like a if it's high, this, if it's low, this, but always talk to your veterinarian kind of thing. But I would love it if you could kind of, I don't know, break it down yeah. for me. And, and we can our, go through each one. Yeah. Yes. So the first one is calprotectin. What is that all about? <laughs> so, <laughs> calprotectin is a marker of neutrophil infiltration into the gut lining, technically. So it neutrophil are white blood cells. And then just, you know, so it's the immune response, a heightened immune response into the gut lining. So like there's some inflammation there and it's got to run repair all this stuff. So it's a direct marker of inflammation in the gut lining. It is used and it's, you know, we look at fecal, there's research also at serum. So serum has had not quite the relationship um, with, with gut health. So um, Fecal calprotectant is a great marker. It lets you know, is there any inflammation and what's the level of that inflammation? You'll see in research papers, like at universities, vet schools, they'll say if it's, you know, at one level, the first level, you should try changing your pet food. At the next level, give them antibiotics. At the next level, start with steroids. And that's, you know, more conventional. So what we see in more integrative, holistic <laughs> veterinary care is, you know, starting to look at the, the whole pet, um, getting anti-inflammatories, changing pet foods, ch- diet, those kind of things. So it's, you know, it's, it's an inflammation marker. And it will also come down as, you know, as treatment improves what's going on. Okay. So, so yeah, that sounds like a pretty pretty interesting one. Um, thank goodness my dogs was normal. (laughs) Um, because I, I do a lot, you know, and, and I think that's another thing. Like when you're a pet parent that does a lot, like I am, um, (laughs) you kind of want to see the, like, I see that my dog is doing wonderfully. She's, you know, she acts like a puppy, even though she's 10 years old, you know, I, like I get to see all of that, but I'm also kind of a nerd and I like seeing it on paper too. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, we get a lot of people who spend a lot of time and effort with their pet trying to do all the right things. And this just kind of confirms everything you're doing is working. I mean, I, right. yeah, I just recently had to, um, you know, let go of a, 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 the dog who I spent, she was 18 years old and she was pretty spry, like till the end. And then she just, yeah. you know, I all of a sudden, it, was you like, know, it, okay, mom. Aww. Yeah. But it, she was 18 and she was yeah. still chasing after the ball. And I think that's because I put a lot of effort and research into it. And, you know, her tests, it did get a little worse at the end. So, you know, I tried to change things. But yeah, so part of it is like, you're doing all these great things. And even though you can see it, what's really going on inside? Is it just right? Because sometimes, you know, you wouldn't know that there's inflammation down there. You know, it's low grade Mm -hmm. chronic inflammation, and that can cause some significant issues. So it's good to just know all good. I think it could also be very beneficial for skeptics. So you know, a lot of people, they see 
red irritated paw pads or they see chronic ear infections and somebody like me comes along and says, Ooh, it's the gut. And they're like, no, it's their ears. Right. It's their and I'm like, yeah. no, it's the gut. So something like this can also be very beneficial to help people see on the inside because they can't see on the inside. You know what I mean? Like you can't, mm -hmm. you're, you're not opening up your dog. Yeah. <laughs> I like, mean, 70% of your immune systems in your gut. So it's, it's, it's true for an, all mammals. So it's, you know, it's a good way to look and see what's really happening. And the fact that it gets better as you make changes. Mm -hmm. I think yes, that, to be able to see that. Mm -hmm. And like the Calprotectin, Secretory IgA, they're together. Um, I think that's, if I had to pick one test and I couldn't do the comprehensive, I would pick one that has either the inflammation and immunity or the basic gut check. Something that has the Calprotectin in it, because to me, it's, it's you know, a great marker. And if there's no inflammation, then probably a lot of other things are doing okay. But mm -hmm. um, it's always my go-to if you had to pick. Oh, I love that tip. Um, and so you said secretory IgA, and that is the next on the list. What is that? Okay. So secretory IgA is the first line of defense at the gut lining. So okay. it is, um, it's, it's IgA is immunoglobulin. So there's several immunoglobulins, I, you know, IgG, IgE is what actually causes aller true allergies, but IgA is um, the first lining of defense. So it's like on all your mucous membranes, so your nose, you know, down the, in the intestines. Um, so it can identify like it, it will jump up if there's parasites or pathogens or food reactions. So it's there to, and it also correlates with a lot, it works with um, a lot of the commensal bacteria. So it does tend to, unless it's having to jump up for some kind of parasitic or food sensitivity reaction, it generally, generally will follow the commensal bacteria. So it, you know, comes up and down with that. Um, so a, a robust secretory IgA given that nothing else is going on, would make me think that there's robust commensal, which are good bacteria. Okay. All right. That makes sense. So, and yeah. So if it's elevated, I'm looking for, is there parasites? Is there pathogens? Is there um, a food reaction? So it's also, if it's, you know, it, if it's really high or really low, it can be associated with, um, you know, skin conditions, because a lot of food reactions are often associated with skin conditions. Absolutely. And I don't know if you can hear that. I apologize if you can. My gardener has the, the leaf blower <laughs> like right outside my window. <laughs> um, but, you know, I have recorded with them here before and it doesn't show up. So I, I don't know. We'll see. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, Really, I could hear a low hum and there's the you know, purple around like you're talking, but okay. I'm just always on guard. My other dog doesn't start barking like somebody comes oh. to the front door. But yeah, so no. secretory IgA is like, it's a good supporting marker along with calprotectant um, to see. It's all, there he barked. Um, it's also <laughs> um, low levels can be, I can identify that an immune system has just been tapped. You know, mm -hmm. like high levels mean something I want to go look for, mm -hmm. but low, at least that's the response you're supposed to get. Like they're, they're supposed to respond to it. So if they have really low levels, it's, it, are they, have they just been tapped out and they need some overall immune support, some Saccharomyces boulardii or something that's going to help in that situation. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's like in puppies, you know, young animals, there is some variability. So we usually say to try to wait till they're a little bit older, at least, you know, I might do it at six months, but probably I'd wait till a year to really, you know, for, for secretory IgA. Okay. That's good to know as well. Um, so the next one on the list is zonulin. Okay. Yeah, so Missing zonulin, right? yeah, it, yep, zonulin. It's a marker that identifies, well, leaky gut. So it increased intestinal permeability. So, and I'm going to use my, I'm going to do my little diagram. And I think we have this, you know, so look, um, 
you know, like if you have your, these are your intestinal cells, like they're lined up next to each other and they're generally pretty close. And at the top, they'll have like these little things called tight junctions that hold them together. So intestines aren't impermeable because otherwise nothing. So they're just always regulating what's coming in and out. And there's a tight junction and then there's some other, you know, things that hold them together. But zonulin can come out when, you know, there's things happening in when there's increased intestinal permeability and it can pull the tight junctions off. So then the, the cells aren't as closely together and that can, I can happen when, you know, there's a lot of inflammation, there's uh, changes in gut bacteria. Gluten is known to cause that to increase, to the, increase the intestinal permeability. And the problem with increased intestinal permeability or leaky gut is that the whole system of like checking things in and, you know, things moving in and out just gets kind of goes haywire. It's, you know, so things come in, you wouldn't have normally, or the gut wouldn't have let in, and then there's an immune reaction to it. Like, what's this thing doing here? So oftentimes when you see really high zonulin levels and there's increased intestinal permeability, you can see a lot of food reactions. Mm-hmm. Yes, because- that makes so much sense. And that's, yeah, explaining, that is a really great explanation. I tried I try to explain that to people so much. And I'm like, am I doing a good job? That's a good one. That's a good explanation. <laughs> I'm sure you do great. <laughs> um, because, it, I mean, you know, our dogs are, I feel like there just are so many dogs today that are suffering with intestinal permeability. And it is causing a lot of, like you said, food sensitivities and a lot of that. And it just it radiates, like it starts in the gut, like you're saying, and and it just like radiates throughout the body. And then you get what we've been talking about. You get the red irritated skin and the chronic ear infections and the, it's just like a, like a cyclone in the body. (laughs) Like (laughs) it's all going wrong now. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, and I think it helps to see like, is there increased intestinal permeability? Is there inflammation? How is secretory IgA your first line of defense doing? So kind of it starts to build on itself. Mm -hmm. And then we also, I I think probably the next one on the list that we look at is anti-gliadin. Yes. Yeah. So we're just looking to see, are you having or is, is your pet having a reaction to gluten? So it's one of the things that's associated with increased zonulin, increased intestinal permeability. So not, you know, not every pet's going to have that, but um, some pets do have significant reaction to gluten and you can pull the gluten out and go gluten free. And that's certainly known in people and pets to bring down the zonulin, Um, you know, and and then Uh soothing, you know, fixing the gut may also help that whole reaction. Right. So in your professional opinion, is it gluten or is it that the gluten, so much gluten is laced with glyphosate? Like, what do you think is really yeah, going on? I mean, I think it's, you know, certainly, I don't think we know all the synergistic effects. You know, they know that gluten can cause a rise in zonulin and so can combination certain gut bacteria. But glyphosates are going to cause uh, problems within the gut, within the gut bacteria, you know, so I think it's, it's, I don't think you can divorce necessarily one from the other. So I don't, you know, if you got somebody who got really clean gluten <laughs> and did a research study, I've, you know, not seen that one, but. Um, That's what I'm wondering. Um, are, are, do you just test in the U.S.? Currently, we just test in the U.S. So hopefully, you know, we can okay. move, move to Canada and international. That's our goal. Yeah, our, our big sticking point is shipping. So it gets to be right. really expensive to ship. Yeah, because I'm wonder. I know I keep hearing, and I've I, I've only been to Italy once, but um, we actually buy if we're going to eat pasta, we buy pasta from Italy. <laughs> Italy, and my understanding is that it is a much cleaner grain 
Yeah, they, they do they, a couple things different. Yeah, so they I, I think that they don't they don't have all the the stuff that we have. Um, and then Fasano, um, Alfonso Fasano is the person who discovered zonulin and um, its connection with gluten. And so, you know, in, in, in he's, he's uh, an MD, so he studies people. But um, he has said that, you know, anybody who like suddenly eats a whole bunch of gluten is likely going to have a zonulin. So zonulin's not just one level. It's more like a glucose. Like it's going to go up and down. It's going to, you know, things are going to come in. So there's always fluidity in the gut. But once it goes really high, that's a problem. But as far as the Italian stuff, like Italian bread, because I hear that all the time, like, well, I went to Italy and I ate the bread all the time. It was great. Mm -hmm. um, they do a different proofing, at least for bread. They they um, proof it. You know, it's like a nine hour process where in the States, it's like it's a half hour. It's risen. Let's go. So they just and that breaks down gluten. And then I think it is a lot cleaner. There are laws on who can use, mm -hmm. you know, who can use the product. And certainly... You know, our is I think it's owned by Bear at this point is you know trying to push mm -hmm. all the other countries into doing it. So yeah, hopefully they okay. can yeah you know, stay strong. I I hope so. I mean, we need we need some refuge in the world, don't we? <laughs> yeah, and if we have to go to Italy to get it, so be it. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, pancreatic elastase. Yeah. So it's pancreatic. Kind of yeah, it's um. So the pancreas secretes enzymes to digest food. Um, you know, there's endocrine and exocrine function. So it also does like insulin and things. But the um, that's the exocrine function is digestive enzymes. So you know, when it, something gets eaten, then the enzymes get secreted. So elastase is what is called a proteolytic enzyme. So it gets it secretes when you when the protein gets eaten to break down protein like amylase breaks down fat um oh lipase breaks down fat amylase breaks down carbohydrates so <laughs> elastase is much more stable than some of the other enzymes so they look at it, you can look at it because it can give you a mark it's a marker of overall pancreatic function now in people you can kind of get low levels and it might be slightly impaired and i think in pets, they're going to find that in dogs and cats. But right now, it's really you have it or you don't. And when it goes really low, it's usually associated with weight loss or diarrhea. And if, it, if it's super low on your test and, and your pet has those symptoms, you should probably seek medical attention, I mean, veterinary <laughs> attention for your pet. But generally, it's, it's just looking to see what's overall pancreatic function. Most, you know, dogs are going to be pretty high. In, in that, I, I'm trying to remember the cutoffs like 900. What was your dog? So that was one of the things I was uh, going to hopefully talk about a little bit because so my dog is um, she is raw fed. She will get treats every now and again that aren't up to my standards, I would say. <laughs> but um, I say treats, not like treats that I treats that I buy are definitely up to my standard, but like. Human you know, food people will, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody comes over, <laughs> just fed your dog. Yes. It says that normal is above 30, mm -hmm. borderline is 10 to 30, and low is below 30. Or, I'm sorry, below 10. Below 10. Mm -hmm. And my dog is at zero. <laughs> so I'm actually following up. She has no symptoms. Okay. So I'm following up with my veterinarian this week and just, you know, making sure everything is okay. But like on the surface, I'm like, she's fine. Like her, her poops are normal. She's definitely not losing weight. Like I, I feel like she's fine. I'm just being over, over cautious probably. No, I think that it's, yeah. I mean, a lot of dogs are in the thousands. So, you know, I think it's worth, worth looking at. And that's where it is a good idea to go talk to your vet. Because um, if she doesn't have those symptoms, it's obviously, I mean, everything's more concerning with significant symptoms. Right. So. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and she does. I, but, you know, I have certainly worked with dogs who have like EPI, um, mm-hmm. so that, like pancreatic insufficient. And so, you know, having none would be like, oh, crap, maybe is, is the pancreas not working? <laughs> But yeah, she, I mean, like so I said, it would also depend on when she'd eaten. I mean, you'd imagine that it would be a little higher, especially if she's raw because she's getting more protein. So, you know, mm-hmm. you know, looking at all those factors. Um, right. But yeah, yes. it, it, does she have diarrhea? Certainly pancreatic function decreases a little bit as you age. Um, and then do you give her any digestive enzymes? So not normally, um, okay. for, after I got the test results back, I'm very big on, um, what can we do with food before mm-hmm. I do any supplementation? So I'll do like, um, um, green juju has a, um, fermented beets and red cabbage. So I'll add that in because the, the, the wild fermented beets add like a natural digestive enzyme. Mm-hmm. Of course, there are like other digestive enzyme supplements out there. And certainly a dog with like EPI would need, uh, you know, a heavier, a heavier, like a a real digestive enzyme. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But no, yeah, I I will add that in sometime. And I've kind of started adding it in after I got this test just to see. But um, no, I mean, not generally speaking. I, she's, Mm -hmm. like I said, she's not symptomatic at all. So, um, I just was like, well, I'm just going to follow up with the vet and, and make sure that no. everything is okay. But also like maybe something isn't right and I'm just not seeing it yet and we can catch it really early. I don't know. Like that could be, a, I assume, a possibility too. And another benefit of, of regularly testing your animal to stay on top of their health. Right, right. Yeah, because, I mean, we're not going to, if somebody was taking digestive enzymes, we wouldn't pick that up. We don't pick exogenous enzymes up. But, yeah, it's certainly something. Have you noticed a difference giving her digestive enzymes? Not really. I mean, mm-hmm. maybe a, a little less gassy, maybe. <laughs> She's not super <laughs> gassy to begin with, so, you know, it's hard to tell, but... um yeah, it's normally like like I was telling you, if she gets when she gets her her um, nighttime snack, <laughs> she like <laughs> it's a thing in my house. She has to get a nighttime snack, and it's usually leftovers of whatever protein we have eaten that night. So like steak or like fajita beef or like like whatever. Mm-hmm. If we had chicken, she'll have to. That's the kind of thing, the treat that she normally gets. Right, but, right, um, and. Certainly that can be overdone sometimes and she will get a little gassy <laughs> after that. <laughs> um, yeah, and it, cause, because it is not diagnostic of pancreatic function. It's just getting, right. you know, an idea. So, yes. Um, um, yeah, that's what I kind of, I wanted to make sure to include that so that we could, you could say that basically like yeah no there's a there's a blood test you use for for pancreatic function so Mm -hmm. this you know it may be and when you look at the research because research on cats and dogs is like you well this particular test we're not doing in cats right now but for dogs it's like oh it's you know very severe or or nothing and so in people we know there's a range and i think that the more we test the more we're going to find that out in pets. It just isn't in literature. So Gotcha. So the last one on the list, I'm going to try, I'm going to try to say this. Okay. Beta glucuronidase. Very good. That's it. It's beta glucuronidase. Oh, I got it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that's an enzyme. Like we make it, dogs make it, cats make it, you know, mammals bake it. It helps you break down beta carotene and things. You don't need very much of it. Like your dog doesn't need a lot of it. So you make a little bit, but gut bacteria also make it. So if it's really high, it can identify that you've got, you know, and not all gut bacteria, but so it can identify that you've got some dysbiosis, you've got some imbalance in your commensal opportunistic, good, bad bacteria, and that the levels are, are, are high and that they're making this beta glucuronidase. So 
the problem with having elevated beta glucuronidase, okay, I'm going to get technical here. Um, <laughs> so okay. beta glucuronidase likes to pull, I'll, I'll say it and then I'll explain it, likes to okay. pull the glucuronide molecule off of toxins or hormones or things that have gone through glucuronidation. So glucuronidation is an intracellular antioxidant process. So mammals do that. So glucuronidation will, it's, it's part of your detox. It's part of detoxification. So okay. it is going to detox, you know, toxins or hormones, and then it sends them on out. So my analogy of it is glucuronidation will put handcuffs on, well, we see it sees all this excess tox, toxins or hormones, it put handcuffs on them, and it sends them out in the stool. And so it's supposed to just go on out. But then beta glucuronidase is like, hey, I love those handcuffs. And so it takes the handcuffs and suddenly it has the handcuffs and the toxin and the hormone is then free. And instead of leaving, it gets reabsorbed. So if it's really high, it can help concentrate the toxins or hormones. So, um, mm -hmm. and in people, super high levels uh, have been associated with colon cancer. I mean, because you're uh, reabsorbing all these things mm -hmm. that were supposed to be just let go. So um, that's the problem with having it elevated. And so you, why you... We say that if it's really high, then that's when you might want to do a, another test to look at like a microbiome test and see, well, what is the actual bacteria? How imbalanced is it? I mean, you could certainly start with, you know, you know, looking at dysbiosis and trying to treat that, but that's the, the problem with it. So, and to, yeah. so you think of like a pet that, you know, maybe they just, you know, they're running through the neighbor's yard and the neighbor sprays all the time, or, you know, there's toxins there. Um, so, you know, those kind of things can just get more concentrated or even, you know, a heavy set dog, this happens in people, you know, likely going to happen in dogs, a heavy set dog that loses a bunch of weight. Those are toxins stored in there. So um, a lot of those fat-soluble toxins get stored in fat. So like sometimes, okay. if, you know, people who lose a whole bunch of weight may say, oh, they felt terrible. And part of that is you've just now released all these fat-soluble toxins. That is, I have never heard that before. That is so interesting. So when you burn fat, like if, you're actively losing weight and you're losing substantial amounts of weight and burning fat. The fat releases the toxins that it was holding on to mm -hmm. back into the body. Yeah. So there's really weight loss and toxins. There's not a bunch of research, just really <laughs> minimal there in, in pets, but in people, there's a lot The you know, you can look at POPs, a certain Fats, persistent organic pollutants. Um, they get trapped in the atmosphere. You know, they get trapped and then, you know, they get concentrated. Um, and they're more likely to be in, you know, animal fat. So um, it's in there. But as people get exposed to them, they concentrate. And so people with high levels of these toxins are more, have higher rates of certain cancers or diabetes is pretty common. It's certainly POP levels in the blood and, and diabetes have been correlated with the environment. So, you know, yeah, it's all, it's a contained system in the world. <laughs> yeah, that is so interesting and so crazy. And I, it makes so much sense, but never thought about it before. Um, wow. Awesome. Okay. So the testing again is it's really there to kind of help pet, pet parents along their journey with their pets. Certainly, and I don't think we can reiterate this enough, is not um, is not something you want to use in place of veterinary care. This is something to use alongside veterinary care. <laughs> <laughs> or, yeah, if your pet pet is healthy and you just want to get the kit and just make sure 
I mean, a lot of the things that you can do are, you know, Saccharomyces boulardii or probiotics. You may already be doing them or maybe adding more anti-inflammatory foods or things like that. So, yeah, but certainly if your pet has, you know, significant symptoms, you know, you probably should get, you know, veterinary, (laughs) you know, you're professional. (laughs) Okay. So where can people, um, oh, they can... I think we, oh, I said it earlier, right? Innovativepetlab.com is where they can actually order a test kit. Right. And then when they send it off, um, it again is just a fecal sample. Um, so not difficult at all to do. You fill out the, the online form saying, Hey, guess what? I've got a test kit and this is the kit number and I'm sending you <laughs> yes, in the mail. Please now. register your test kit first. It's right on the top of the box. Cause otherwise we're like, whose poop is this? Um, <laughs> right. We can usually track it down, but not always. So you register the, t- the, the, the test kit, you just put it in the tube. Um, if you can't send it right away, you can put it in the freezer or the fridge and then you just put it in the, you know, all the packaging, you know, put it in a little bag, put that in the box, put the box in the mailer and you just mail it from, you know, your, po- your, your mailbox. You don't have to go to FedEx or anything like that. Um, and then you, like you did, you get the results digitally. You can mm-hmm. download those as a PDF and send them to your vet. You can print them. I mean, we do have vets that do the test. So some of our partners are listed on the page, but most of the time people are doing it and bringing it to their vet. Right. Okay. That makes, yeah, I was just looking at the, the partners page and you've got some really great ones. Of course, I, I mentioned green juju earlier. Fair pet organics is wonderful. Um, cocoa therapy. I love, love cocoa therapy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and they're Jessie, so nice. Guys. Yeah. Yes. Earth buddy who has been on the podcast as well. So wonderful partners you've got going on there. Um, yeah. And then it, I do. You, are you on social at all? Can yeah, we're at Innovative Pet yeah. Lab. Yeah, Innovative Pet Lab everywhere. Yeah, so it's on. Yeah, um, Instagram's probably our most our most popular, but we're you know on all the other stuff. <laughs> okay. Is there anything else that you would like pet parents to know, or any parting like as a scientist, any parting words for you know pet parents out there who are just wanting to do a little bit better for their pets. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, you can do better. You can, well, I don't know if you can do better. That didn't sound (laughs) I mean, there are additional things maybe you hadn't thought of, but looking at these things, you know, what we noticed in the human world kind of happens in the vet world too, that, you know, more conventional doctors or more conventional vets maybe don't, aren't aware of these things. And so, you know, we used to get people all the time, like I have gas and bloating. I went to the gastroenterologist. They did a colonoscopy and said, I don't have colon cancer. It's like, that wasn't my problem. Um, so we see kind of the same things in the vet world. But the treatments generally we're thinking of are changes in diet or, you know, there's a lot of brands that are coming out, like our partners, but a lot more supplement brands targeted for pets. And they're mammals. And so, you know, they can use some of the same type of support. So if you think something's not right, you know, with your with your pet, you can just keep plugging away till you find somebody who is going to help you because there's somebody out there. Um, But, you know, so we're trying to be part of that, you know, self-care. Yeah. Well, I certainly appreciate it. Um, again, I know we've already established I'm a crazy dog mom, but <laughs> I, 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 I was going to say you're not alone. You know? <laughs> no, I'm not alone, but I definitely do. Like, I just love testing. Um, you know, I, obviously I don't want to put my dog through a bunch of unnecessary procedures or right. anything like that, but these are so simple and easy to do. Um, I just have to like pick up her poop and dissected a little bit. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I know when we were first developing the test, we wanted to look at, you know, variability, like you don't want variability. So the best way to test it is to test, you know, I tested my dog, like you know, we tested all our dogs. Um, but you know, morning, afternoon poops every day for 10 days, like what's the variability, what changes, you know, and, and it, it, 
it was stable. So those kind of things like, yeah, I love testing. <laughs> and so, you know, I think the more right. testing is really more information. I get that testing can be expensive. The, the reagents mm -hmm. are expensive. The machines are expensive. So it ends up being pricey, but it does, you know, help give you some information. Yeah, and you're not crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, especially if, cause you know, so many people go on these roller coasters, there is something, their dog isn't feeling well, their, their body isn't functioning properly. And they're just, they go back and back and back to the vet and they spend more and more and more money. And it's, they're doing everything the vet tells them to do and nothing is working. And I, to me, tests like this are empowering because then you can see, okay, this is what's actually going on. And now I have, I can form a plan of attack based off of this versus just continue, you know, continuously throw in band-aids on symptoms that just doesn't get us anywhere. Um, so we need to, you know, for, especially for those people who need to see it black and white on paper, like this is what's going on with my dog this can get you there. So I appreciate you for joining us today, Betsy, oh, and for, for everything. Me. Yes, for everything um, you and your team have set out to do to better pets lives. Um, make sure to follow Innovative Pet Lab. If you're interested in the testing, uh, certainly reach out to me. I'm happy to help you with it. And um, we can we can go from there. So with that, uh, I always say have, you know, give your pets some extra love from me course give your pet some extra love from betsy today as well and then your what is your dog's name oliver oliver so oliver is gonna send some extra love your way as well <laughs> thank you so yeah, much i'm sure he's sitting outside the door <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training the furry family coach just go to the furry family coach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only seven dollars that's the furry family coach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only seven dollars i can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside oh, oh.